Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Adele Myers, author of the new novel, The Tobacco Wives. Fiona Davis, the best-selling historical novelist, said about The Tobacco Wives, Myers brilliantly seduces us with her setting, a North Carolina town of beautiful socialites, opulent dresses, and elegant soirees, before revealing a terrible secret that threatens the entire community. This is a story of courage, of women willing to take a stand in the face of corporate greed, and most definitely a tale for our times. Adele, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, The Tobacco Wives, how would you describe the novel? Well, very briefly, I would describe it as small town seamstress takes on big tobacco. Someone uh, used that headline. I thought that was like a great, <laughs> very brief description, but I'll tell you a little bit more. Sure. Um, it's basically the story of a young seamstress in 1946, North Carolina, who inadvertently stumbles upon information that she's not supposed to see about uh, dangerous truths about the big tobacco empire that's that's ruling the American South. And so the story is told through the eyes of uh, this 15-year-old girl. Her name is Maddie Sykes. And she's just lost her father in World War II. And her mother basically has a breakdown. Um, she doesn't know how she's going to support herself and her daughter. And so she takes Maddie and drops her off at her great aunt Etta's house in the fictional town of Brightleaf, North Carolina. And through a series of events, Maddie, who's used to just um, assisting her aunt with sewing, ends up taking over for her um, during a really important time. Uh, and she ends up getting drawn into the world of, of these women that everyone in town calls the tobacco wives. So these are the women who are married to the wealthy uh, bright leaf tobacco magnets. And as she gets drawn into this world, which she at first kind of idolizes, I mean, she thinks these women are just have it all. Um, they're wealthy, they're beautiful, et cetera. But as she gets drawn into their world more, she realizes uh, that it is not as perfect as it appears. And she runs across this information and has to decide what to do with it. Sure. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write The Tobacco Wives? Oh, absolutely. So uh, The Tobacco Wives was inspired by my family history. I grew up in North Carolina and spent both of my sets of grandparents and my parents are from Winston-Salem, which is the home of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. And I spent a lot of time there as a kid. And one of my grandmothers was actually a seamstress, so that's kind of where that piece <laughs> came from. <laughs> and then the other grandmother was a hairdresser for the wives of R.J. Reynolds executives in the 1940s. And I was just always fascinated with that. And I can remember like sitting at my grandmother's vanity and she would trim my hair for me and, and kind of like begging her to tell me stories about these glamorous, you know, wealthy women that she used to work for. And um, she never really did give me any good dirt. And I think maybe that was the inspiration. <laughs> I wanted to make it up myself. <laughs> sure. Well, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting the Tobacco Wives published? Is this the first novel you had tried to write? It is the first novel, but it was a very long journey. I, uh, over 20 years ago, I was taking short story writing classes at night. And I've always written. I I majored in journalism um, at UNC Chapel Hill. And I've worked in advertising and PR um, for the last like 20 plus years since college. But I've always wanted to write. And so I wrote a short story about these women um, back in my 20s. <laughs> and that was where the seed of the idea came from. And at the time, my writing teacher had given me some notes and, you know, things on the story. And I found it recently. It was back in the day when we had printouts <laughs> of things. It was not on the computer and her yep. handwritten notes. And she had written a note that said, I think there's a longer 
piece here. I think this could be a novel. And that just stuck with me. Like, you know, those, those points in life where mm -hmm. someone says something and it just, uh, it stuck with me. Uh, but it took me a really long time to decide to write the novel. And I, I decided to do it. Um, and I think part of the reason was a lot of my creative energy was spent in my career and making a living. And I got married. I had a son. And life was busy. So my writing was on the back burner for many, many years. And then about eight years ago, I made the decision that I want to do this. You know, I, I wanted to try to publish a book by the time I turned 50 and I came pretty close. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, you know, I started steadily working on it eight years ago, still working full time, but in between being a mom, a wife, a, you know, advertising mm -hmm. <laughs> executive. And, and so what was the, what was that, uh, writing process like for you, um, to, to finally be writing this novel that you had thought about in the back of your mind and, and the short story that you mentioned for, you know, 15 or 20 mm -hmm. years? Well, I didn't really, I had never written a longer piece like this, so I didn't really know what I was doing. And I went back to that teacher who I had kept in touch with all these years and I asked her for some advice and she actually recommended a book by a mystery writer, Elizabeth George, called Right Away. Mm -hmm. And it was a book about where she breaks down her process for writing a novel and how she develops it. And when I didn't end up following that exactly, but I took some pieces from it that helped me get started. And and I knew I wanted to to focus on these women and this time in history in the late 1940s. And so I started to develop the characters and to do research first and did that for quite a while before I started to, to write. And the book changed a lot over the years. And I did get input. I got input from that teacher who was now working as a freelance editor. I also have been in a book club for 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And I asked my book club to, once the manuscript was finished, to read it as our monthly book, <laughs> which was really terrifying. I, I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> that was really so, scary. You didn't, didn't like it. <laughs> Well, and I said, please, like, be honest, but kind. Like, someone told me once that that having your work critiqued like that is like having open heart surgery with no anesthesia. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good and Yeah. So, um, at, but what was interesting is, and I also joined a small writer's critique group with three, uh, three or four other women, um, and they had a couple of them had had published YA books and they I think it was like a combination of feedback from all of these different people that kind of gave me the confidence to keep going. And especially the women in the critique group, because they had been published and they said, we think we absolutely think you can get this published, which kind of shocked me. And wow. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the little boost that I needed to say, OK, I, I can do this. I can do this. That's great. So, so what was the process once you got it to a, a place that you felt comfortable with? Um, what was the, the process of getting an agent? Did that go quickly or, or how was that? It did not go quickly. <laughs> I, w I wouldn't say quickly. Um, <laughs> it took about a year and a half for me to find an agent. I started by tapping into a couple of um, contacts I had. Uh, you know, friends who knew someone who was an agent, for instance. And mm -hmm. so that kind of got me off out of the slush pile sure. and they at least reviewed it. But those contacts, there are probably a handful of them and they all passed on it, said wasn't wasn't quite right for them. Um, and at the time, the book had a different title. It was called Bright Leaf which is the name of the fictional town where it's based. And the story itself was quite a bit different. So it changed a lot after I got my agent. Um, and I changed the title during, during the process of pitching agents. Um, 
I started to just, it's, it's a tough, long process. I mean, and for me, at least it was. And I think sure. for a lot of other authors, from what I hear, because you have to, I think, I think there's really an, like, you have to have a, a good manuscript, of course, and a good idea for your book, but you also have to have the stars align and the right agent sees it at the right time and mm -hmm. they need something and they, you know, spark to it. So what I, what I did is I decided to spend a lot of time on my pitch letter and I changed the title. And the reason is I kept getting feedback. Like at the time, the book was more focused on the relationship between Maddie, the main character, and the daughter of one of the tobacco wives. Uh, and that relationship was kind of central to the story. And I heard from my book club and from other people, I kept hearing that people weren't that interested in the relationship between the girls. They were more interested in Maddie's relationship with her mother, the tobacco wife, and they wanted to hear more about these tobacco wives. And so I, I realized that's what's, that's, what's interesting. And, and that's what initially inspired it. So I changed the title and I found examples online of other, uh, pitch letters that had that authors, like this was the actual pitch letter that got me my agent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you can find those online. And sure. so I, pr I, I found a couple of those and I really spent some time and you would think being in marketing all my life, I would <laughs> think about this, but I really didn't. I think I was kind of naive and I, oh, I'm done and I'll send it off and somebody will fall in love with it. And it, it didn't work that way. But once I put more effort into the pitch, I was, I was pleasantly surprised at that. I got more interest and eventually and i just used query tracker this mm -hmm. online tool that to help research agents what they're looking for looking into who they who else they represent other you know i wanted to find someone that represented other authors that were kind of in my genre so i i found someone that way cold pitching hey this is jeff host of the podcast you know, sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of information out there. And that's exactly why I love Wondrium. Wondrium is a streaming platform that offers thousands of programs and documentaries from respected experts who really know their stuff. And for the listeners of this podcast, Wondrium has a wide selection of writing resources how to write best selling fiction how to publish your book, writing creative nonfiction, every day is a poem, how to create comics, and much, much more. And the best part, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere with the Wondrium app. Download and watch or listen on the go. Explore all of your wonders with Wondrium and your brain will love it. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash B-O-O-K-S. Again, sign up today at Wondrium.com slash books to get unlimited access with a 14-day free trial. Give it a try. Frontier presents A Tale of Two Homes. I moved in with Frontier Gig Fiber and have been gaming, streaming, and video chatting up a storm with super fast speeds. And I moved in without it and haven't. So you don't have a 100% fiber optic network with 99.99% .99 overall reliability? That's correct. 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 Well, it's never too late to upgrade. Don't just move. Move up with Frontier. Switch to Frontier Gig Service and get a $200 Visa reward card on us. Go to Frontier.com slash moving for complete offer details. Service is subject to availability and all applicable terms and conditions. That's great. Well, when you were researching the tobacco business in the 1940s, was, was there anything that you discovered in your research that surprised you? What surprised me most was um, stories from my family. I, I knew that they all worked in Winston-Salem, that they were involved in, in the business or working for the people that ran R.J. Reynolds. But I really dug into details and talked to my father quite a bit. And 
His father, who worked in the cigarette factories, is no longer alive, but he had passed down stories about working there and what that was like. And I think hearing those firsthand accounts was disturbing and surprising to me. And a lot of those details are in the book because mm -hmm. Maddie gets to visit one of the cigarette factories, kind of sees what and sees and hears what goes on there. Well, are you working on a new novel now? I am. I am <laughs> researching my next novel, uh, and I'm not very far along yet, but I, I know it's going to be set in the South, and I want to do something around another um, cover-up situation and, and one that's not well-known. So I think that's kind of my niche. <laughs> right. <laughs> Southern well, secrets. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well. given your, your long journey with the Tobacco Wives, and now it's out as of March 1st, um, what, what writing advice would you offer for those who might be either beginning their journey or, or kind of midway of working on their own story or novel? I would say to envision success and just keep taking actions toward that goal. Um, I think it's, for me and for many writers, it's such a long journey and there's so many ups and downs. And there were so many times that I doubted myself and felt like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. <laughs> um, and, but I just kept at it. And I think you have to be really persistent and to, and just, believe in yourself. And even if you don't believe in yourself, just keep going anyway. <laughs> That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? I just finished a novel um, by another debut author, uh, Shadows of Pecan Hollow. And it's, a, it's set in the 1970s in Texas. And it's, it's, um, it's been compared to like Paper Moon meets Badlands. So it's kind of dark and twisty. And uh, and I've become friendly with the author. Like we're both going through this journey together of our books just coming out. So that's been pretty cool. And then I'm I almost interviewed done. her. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, I, oh. I, haven't, I haven't released the interview yet, but yes, I did interview her. Oh, Caroline. Yeah, yes. she's yes. she's wonderful. <laughs> yes. uh, and then I'm, I'm almost done with uh, Black Cake which I'm really enjoying as well. Um, it's a book about identity and family and secrets. <laughs> um, uh, so that's, I'm enjoying that. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your debut novel, The Tobacco Wives? I am most active on Instagram and Facebook. So my Instagram handle is Adele J-A-M. And you can find me at Adele Myers on Facebook. And then I also have an author website where I have a lot of uh, photos, uh, inspiration for the book. Um, we didn't get into the advertising piece, but, but tobacco advertising is also a part of this story. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of kind of unbelievable old ads <laughs> on my site <laughs> that you can check out. So that site is adelemyersauthor.com. That's great. People should check out the, those ads. Well, again, we've been speaking with Adele Myers, author of the debut novel, The Tobacco Wives. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Adele, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks so much, Jeff. Great. That was great. My mother woke me in the dead of night again. I felt her standing over my bed, the heat of a flashlight on my face. Maddie, get up. I tried to wake but stay asleep too, fighting with myself in some in-between place. She paced back and forth, arguing under her breath with an imaginary someone. I wondered what the matter was this time. Surely it couldn't be worse than what she did last Sunday. Get up and come with me, she'd said that night. It was four in the morning, and her green eyes were wild. She'd rushed me onto my feet the wood floor cool and in need of sweeping, gritty under my toes. I need your help, she'd said, her voice urgent. I still had a sore spot on my arm where she'd grabbed me in that moment, dragging me into the living room. 
I thought maybe I'd left my sketchbook and dress patterns out, that I was in for it. Then I saw the living room and understood it wasn't my mess she was worried over. She'd made one of her own. Mama had stacked up clothes and Daddy's model airplanes, paintings, and pictures. There were novels with their spines bent back and photographs ripped into little pieces, an unruly pile smack in the middle of the room. We have to get rid of all your father's things, all of them. Mama had hauled the outdoor trash can inside, the heavy metal one, leaving a wet brown trail on the carpet. Why? I asked. Tears in my eyes at the sight of Daddy's belongings strewn around so careless. Why would we do that? My father's undershirts were stacked on the worn cushion of his favorite wing back. His hat lay on the floor next to the wooden kit he propped his foot on to shine his shoes. I loved the gasoline smell of his shoe polish and the brisk sound of the brush when he buffed his boots to a high gleam. I reached out to rescue it, to save the memory of my daddy. But Mama gave my hand a smack. I'm the mother, and you do as I say. The mother. She always said it that way. Like she needed to remind me, or maybe herself, of her place. When Daddy died last fall, Mama took to her bed for months. At first, I thought she'd come down with a bad flu. I wiped her brow with cool washcloths and set steaming mugs of honey lemon tea at her bedside. I sat with her through the long days, making sure she was still breathing. But she wasn't sick. At least her body wasn't. Finally, she came out of hibernation, and over the last few weeks, had barely slept at all. She was real alert when darkness came, pacing, scribbling notes in a steno pad, and waking me to join her. Flashlight in hand, she'd jolt me out of bed in the middle of the night to tell me that she had to move on, that she had to find a new husband to pay the bills. She couldn't very well court a suitor with reminders of daddy lying around the house, now could she? I'd started hiding things from her after the fire. Not just possessions, feelings too. On the night we burned what was left of Daddy's belongings, I'd hidden his pen and Grandpa Sykes's pocket watch in my sewing satchel, where I kept my sketchbook, fabric swatches, and patterns. All the secret things I didn't want Mama getting her hands on were in there, including my stash of cigarettes and all my money. Six dollars and change I'd earned sewing house dresses and mending hand-me-downs for the neighbors. Your father left us, Maddie. Mama had shouted the night of the fire, grabbing her wedding photograph. The edge of the metal frame scraped her arm, causing a red line to bloom up through her skin. Mama, you cut yourself. She didn't seem to hear me. There was no talking to her when she got like this. Three years I waited for him to come home, she said, tossing the picture in the metal trash can with a clank. Three years of waiting for him to make good on his word. I promise, honey, he said. When this war is over, we'll move out of Haywood Holler, get away from the smell, and find a nice house up on Pine Mountain. I promise. <laughs> well, promises are cheap. Now we can hardly afford this place. Mama always complained about the smell of the paper mill. I'll be damned if I'm gonna live out the rest of my days next to that stench she'd say. Our whole town stank like rotten eggs from the heat and chemicals they used to pulp wood chips into paper. But Daddy had worked there. All the other daddies, too. Didn't that count for something? You don't know what you're talking about, she'd said. When I told her the good outweighed the bad, that without the paper factory, Daddy wouldn't have a job. But she didn't listen to me. She sure didn't listen the night of the fire. He can't help his plane got shot down. He didn't want to die, I'd said, trying to defend Daddy, trying to pull things from the pile, trying to make sense of it all. When you switch to Frontier Gig Service, you don't have to worry about your internet dropping out at the worst possible times. And you can talk to friends and present in work meetings without sounding like this. Seriously. No more of that nonsense. 
Change to fiber. Change to better. Upgrade to Frontier Gig Service on our 100% fiber network for $69.99 and get a $200 Visa reward card on us. Exclusive offer for qualified households only. Go to Frontier.com slash FL Fiber for complete offer details. Service is subject to availability in all applicable terms and conditions. The future will be amazing. And that's all well and good. But what about today? You can feel the rush of a 400 horsepower Nissan Z. Or climb to new heights in the all-terrain Nissan Frontier. Light up the road in the all-electric Nissan Aria that feels like a sci-fi dream come true. The future will be great, but today is made for thrill. All you have to do is get in a Nissan and drive. 2023 Aria and Z not yet available for purchase. Expected availability is this spring for 2023 Z and this fall for 2023 Aria.